So, okay, Mark 12, 28 to 34. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is in a situation of challenge. Yeah. And increasingly, so very much are we. What do you do with that? We're in a situation where people are challenging us about God things. And in our liberal society, there is a perception that the Christian thing to do, the Christian response, is to roll over when your faith is challenged or when we as the representatives of Christian faith are attacked. Roll over. Is that the right way to handle it? Well, in this situation, Jesus is uh, in a situation where people are coming at him but he seems to betray an understanding that he must persist in the telling of the truth. So however risky it seems, because that's what he does, that's what we do if we are followers of Jesus. It's difficult because people are challenging us for answers, but what they need and what they may be looking for is answers and relationship. But mainly relationship. And this situation in Mark 12 is one where Jesus models for us how important it is to give a good answer when you're directly challenged, a robust one, as a foundation for building right relationship. My thesis then is this, that in these situations where we're challenged, disciple-making disciples prioritise two things. They prioritise the great commandment and the Great Commission. There's your challenge, 21st century Christian. In conflict ministry, and Jesus is currently, as we'll see, going through that phase of his life where he's involved in his conflict ministry, in that sort of situation, when conflict is the trigger for our ministry, no one will seem to love you, but God your Father will, if you can rise to prioritizing these things the great commandment and the great commission strong challenge give a good answer on the road to establishing right relationship rather than further conflict so may god grant us eyes here to see that and wisdom to know step by step how to do it his way because this is crucial for our time. So the context that uh, we find this all happening in Mark 12 is one where Jesus burst onto the Galilean scene roughly, roughly three years before. Announcing that something big had changed in the cosmos, the kingdom of God is now at hand, and the only proper response to that fact, that the kingdom of God is at hand, is to repent and believe the gospel. And Jesus then spelled out the consequences of that choice, to repent and believe the gospel, in terms of following him. If you repent and believe the gospel, you will follow him because you've believed him. And in following him, you will become fishers of men just as he was. And that's his priority in this situation where people are in conflict with him. He's a fisher for people, even if they seem to be coming at him quite aggressively and quite abruptly at that point in time. He spelled out the consequences then in terms of following him, in terms of becoming fishers of men just as he was. And from that point, he spent the first act of Mark's Gospel in, in chapters 1 to 8, justifying the contention that the Kingdom of God was at hand. And he justified it by demonstrating his real-time authority as King over sickness, the natural world, and the supernatural world. Healing the sick, raising the dead, stilling the storms, and liberating people like the Gadarene demoniac. That's Act 1. Now, Act 2 began just after Peter responded to all of that by saying, you are the Messiah, you are the king who's come in his kingdom. And Jesus then in the second act, as they journey up towards Jerusalem along the, the pilgrim road to Jerusalem for that last Passover, Jesus then teaches them what sort of king Messiah he was going to be. He was going to be a suffering king Messiah who would lay down his life, having passed through rejection, despisement and sorrow, lay down his life for his people. And in doing so, he taught those who would be his followers 
what they would go through as they followed him. The man of sorrows, despised, rejected, acquainted with grief. That second act then continues all along that pilgrim route up to Jerusalem for what would be Jesus' last Passover festival. Up to Mark 11, where Jesus enters Jerusalem to acclamation, being acclaimed as her coming king. And at that point, the conflict ministry begins. As the Jewish authorities murderously challenge the king's authority to reign over his kingdom. That will be the third act of Mark. And this section ends in his death, his resurrection, to pay the price of human sin, to reign as the everlasting Lord of life. So Mark 12, the passage we're looking at today, is set at the heart of what I know as the conflict ministry. The time when people came at Jesus because of what he stood for, because of his message, his proclamation that the kingdom of God was at hand, that we should repent and believe the gospel and follow him, becoming fishers of men as we did so. Mark 12 is set at the heart of that. In Jerusalem, amongst murderously hostile people, and they're trying hard to trap him so that they can do away with him, by their questioning. And now here comes this particular question. Mark 12, 28. Just before we look at it, notice where it arises geographically. We'll need this in a minute. Jesus is in the temple courts. Mark eleven twenty-seven 27 gives us that clue where all this argument about the law traditionally took place, particularly at the time of the major festivals. And the man putting the question, who's that? He is a scribe, a teacher of the law. The group that were predominantly Pharisees, not the Sadducean priestly group who ran the temple, dedicated to temple ritual, all its ritual detail. But these guys, the sort that asked the question, were dedicated to living out the life that they thought God required in dependence on the living God, the living God who deployed angel armies and did miracles and raised the dead. And as this guy, this scribe, this teacher of the law who comes from that sort of background, as he wanders up in the temple courts, he overhears Jesus doing what? He overhears Jesus giving good answers when he's challenged. Now that's crucial. He overhears Jesus giving good answers, and he, he thinks, ooh, what's happening here? And he wants to test the Lord with his own very best question. The man is engaged because he's heard a good answer to robust questioning and challenge. He comes for a good answer. But Jesus moves him on from argumentation towards relationship. And that really is a telling part of what's going on here. So uh, the question in Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard, him de heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, that's, you know... You think, well, what a funny question, which is most important? Well, it's a common, a common question against the scribal background, against the culture of the time and, and the background this guy's from. It's familiar from scribal debates about the law. The rabbis discussed which commandments were what they called heavy and which were what they called light, ranking certain sorts of laws as more essential than others. According to scribal reckoning, there were 613 individual commandments in the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. So finding a useful summary is a valid concern. Okay? This guy comes up with that question. Notice the tone of his inquiry, though. He is a scribe. And the scribes have given Jesus a hard time, ever since the early part of the Lord's Galilean ministry. But as he approaches Jesus here, the man doesn't come as earlier members of his party, as part of a group, to attack. Explicitly trying to catch Jesus out. This man just happens by, here's what's going on, and in typical adversarial style, typical of his background, he chips in with his very best question. 
Jesus doesn't seem to have a problem with that. Jesus, we're told, is, imp is, is, is impressing this guy with his answers. And what it says in the text here is that this guy thought they were good, wholesome and satisfying. That's the word that's used, good answers. But he has a strong question to offer in that combative spirit of scribal debate. Don't just be put off because people come at you hard. What's going on behind his eyes, this guy? Jesus is in a unique position to work out what's going on behind his eyes because he's the Lord of all and he tends to know things. But, but always have that question in mind. That would be wise, wouldn't it? What's, this guy's coming at me hard. What's going on behind his eyes? That's the question, verse 28, which is the most important commandment in the law. And it's a legitimate question. We understand where it's coming from. Look at Jesus' response in verses 29 to 31. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But there's another one as well. Now Jesus is taking on the man's question and he's giving him a straight and a strong and a good answer but he's not exactly accepting the parameters of the question. And sometimes we need to do that. The parameters of the question are wrong. So Jesus is going to say there is one that comes first. The first one comes first and it gives rise rationally to the next and I'm going to tell you both. So here it comes. Jesus, in verses 29 to 30, quotes Deuteronomy 6. Unlike the other Gospels, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, as well as 5. And Deuteronomy 6, 4 gives us a theological background to the commandment that we find in, in Deuteronomy 6, 5. What do we know about these verses? They are the opening part of the Shema. They are familiar as a summary of true religion because they were repeated twice daily in standard Jewish devotions. I think they probably still are. So it's an unsurprising answer and a very familiar answer from Jesus about a man's duty before God. You know this. It's in the Shema. You do it twice a day. And, and that, those verses there in Deuteronomy 6 they represent a clear summary of the first table of the law. You know, Jesus had two uh, Moses had two tablets when he came down from Sinai, two parts of the law. First part of the Ten Commandments is about our duty before God. The second part is about our duty before our fellow human beings that God has made to be in his image. And we honour God by honouring his image in humanity. So the scribe has asked for one main commandment, the most important commandment in the law, and Jesus immediately brought up another. This is your duty towards God. This is what the law teaches you towards God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and so on. But also we have a responsibility to the image of God in man. And that's crucially important too. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, possibly, Jesus knew there were people from this scribal class teaching things like their doctrine of Corban. That is, that religious giving exempted them from caring for their parents and so forth. There was a tendency to put acts of extra-religious piety ahead of more mundane-seeming responsibilities that God had actually laid on people. And Jesus is showing that our duty towards God, the first table of the law, implies respect for the way he has ordered things throughout his creation. It should be like this in his creation. And the second table of the law applies to those things. So Jesus therefore cites Leviticus 19.18, that is remembered as the year that uh, the First World War ended, yeah? Leviticus 19.18, and he says this, verse 31, the second commandment is this, love your neighbour as yourself. That's Leviticus 19, would you believe? It doesn't make you a Christian to be a nice chap. The second table of the law does not take precedence over the first. The first thing is to love the Lord your God. But it doesn't make you a consistent Christian to be a religious chap, putting God first, apparently, but caring nothing for the people that your God made and has sent his son to die to save. 
Now, you'd have thought the question has now been met, that the answer has been fully given, and that the account in Mark is now free to move on to something else. But the answer we've heard, which is in itself nothing new, it is not what this account is about, which is why the account does not move on immediately. The fact that it doesn't yet move on shows us the main message is only now about to be delivered. If dealing with challenges to us for our faith position were just a matter of giving good answers, we'd know nothing of this incident beyond verse 31. It is about giving good answers, but that's not the big point here. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been told about this next bit. The incident would be closed, move on. But what happens next? And it's being spelled out for people who are Christians in Rome, remember, because Mark's Gospel is written with the great help of Peter, who was an eyewitness of all these things, for the church, the believers at Rome. What happens next illustrates how Jesus seeks not just to convince his opponents of the crucial abstract truth, but to draw people who come at him with hard questions, to draw them on into relationship, into saving relationship, because the kingdom of God is at hand and people need to repent and believe the gospel. Even the hostiles, because those who are not in are hostile, in some way or other. Opposition is opportunity. Peter through Mark seems to be saying to the persecuted believers in Rome. Opposition is opportunity, not for our vindication, but for their salvation and for his accompanying glory. So, in verses 32 to 34, the account continues. Firstly, with this guy giving us his appreciation of what Jesus has just said, verses 32 to 3. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Big thing. Big thing. Where are they standing? You see, we, we, at the very beginning, we said the context is important here. They're standing in the Jerusalem temple when, at Passover, arguably the biggest, most politically charged, certainly, festival of the year. Yes. To love the Lord your God, that God is one, no other but him, to love him with all your heart, understanding, strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself, that's more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Like blue touch paper, back away! in that context. Now, now the language used by the scribe is, is highly redolent of the language of Hosea 6.6. 6. And it's worth looking, given that that's the context, and given that this is what's happening, it's worth having a little look at Hosea 6.6. 6. Because what happens in Hosea is this. God basically points out the sins of the people all around, and of Israel, and of Judah. And then you get this coming back to God, sort of imagined coming back to God through the mouth of the prophet. And the quotation goes like this. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us in pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, very short period of time, he will revive us. On the third day he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord, let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains as an inevitability. Like the spring rains that water the earth, inevitability. And then in verse 4 of Isaiah 6, God's voice breaks in through the prophet. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. You're skin deep. You're skin deep. Your religiosity is not a deep spirituality. You are skin deep. You don't mean it. You don't mean these acts of repentance. You're banking on my favour. You're just playing games with me, presuming on my goodness. Therefore, verse 5, I will cut you in pieces with my prophets. 
I killed you with the words of my mouth, then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire, and here's the bit that's really relevant to what the scribe is saying here, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, now the point is about the relative importance of mercy over the sacrificial system. But the man is alluding to people whose love is like the morning mist. He's looking around him in the temple and he's saying all oh, this ritual religion is like love like the morning mist. Religion taking precedence over relationship. And Hazir is about nothing if it's not about real heart relationship with God. Real heart relationship with God. Now, of course, given that the temple and the sacrificial system will be gone by AD 70, this passage is going to be poignant indeed. And later generations of Christians are going to look at this, no doubt, and say, ooh, ooh, ooh that was relevant, because now the, the temple and, and so on is gone. For the time being, please just notice what gets said in, in these verses. The really important bit is the way that Jesus now responds to that level of understanding, that level of desire for actual, genuine, faith to be evident which is what we see in the guy Jesus turns to that guy who's offered that appreciation of Jesus and he offers this encouragement to him verse 34 when Jesus saw he'd answered wisely he said to him you are not far from the kingdom of God that phrase again that what Jesus is all about he comes proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand and they should repent and believe the gospel Jesus says you're looking for this you're looking for what's on offer in the gospel here you are looking for the real thing heart religion faith you are not far from the kingdom of God now this is interesting and from then on no one did ask him any more questions Jesus saw the man had answered wisely. He'd listened to, been impressed by Jesus' answer, and let that be known publicly, whatever else his friends would say, whatever else had gone before. And in responding to Jesus, in this way, the man has betrayed knowledge, not just of Isaiah 6.6, 6, but also of passages like 1 Samuel 15.22, and of Micah 6.6-8, 6 which speak of heart faith being more important than external religion. But what the Bible knowledge does for him is it gets him to the point where he can be commended. It's not the Bible knowledge the man is commended for. It, it's the way that his will is aligned with what he knows of the Bible. Yes, he knows the Jewish scriptures, but Jesus states the commendation in terms that relate to the man's stance on authority. The kingdom of God. You are not far from being under the authority of God, from the kingdom of God, from the reign and rule of God in your heart by grace through faith. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus recognizes this man knows the difference between finding leaves on a tree and finding fruit on it. And that is about what makes all the difference. Now, did you notice that poignant little bit at the end there and from that point on no one dared ask him any more questions why <clears throat> it may well have been the reason that they didn't want to hear any more answers from him because Jesus was going to be asking for leaves but not for fruit uh, not for leaves but for fruit and that I suspect is why so many people still suppress the truth in their wickedness to use the phrase from Romans 1 they're happy to discuss public leaves, but they shrink back from a willingness to show personal fruit. And Jesus has got to move this guy to personal fruit. Not just external show of leaves. For verse 35 onwards, it's Jesus himself who's posing all the questions, or speaking exclusively at his own initiative. No one dares ask him any more questions, but Jesus takes it to them. In a situation where the culture has become hostile to him, and is seeking to persecute him. Should we pull back because our cost culture is hostile? Should we pull back because we get a strong antipathetic response? That's a big word for a Sunday morning, I must be tired. A strong uh, anti-response, that'll do. Jesus doesn't. From this point onwards in the conflict ministry, Jesus is increasingly taking the battle to them. The battle for hearts as well as minds. So, by way of conclusion, 
What are our thoughts and our objectives when our faith is directly challenged in a hostile culture? Relevant for Mark's readers in Rome, relevant increasingly for us in the West now today. Jesus' priority is the kingdom of God. And that does not mean that he appeases his aggressors. Quite the contrary, he gives good answers, true answers. And in the following encounters, it is he who takes the battle, as it were, to his enemies. But his priority is the kingdom of God. Not winning the argument, but winning people over to see, to recognise, to accept and to live within the right authority of the king in his kingdom. Jesus is not in the business of the kingdom of God to appease everyone, to be sure that he stays well thought of. He stands up to both bullies and aggressors. And, and it is he who then puts them in the hot seat next. He is here to proclaim the kingdom of God, which means embracing challenge and calling for change. Embracing your challenge of me, calling for change from you, if we put it in those terms. He's not here to leave mankind in their sins by being nice to everybody, because that isn't nice to everybody. No matter how cherished or popular those sins might be, no matter how much a problem he faces in doing so, he's here to set people free from the things that control, they're going to mess up their destiny. Remember in the end, from their perspective, they would kill him to finally, they thought, shut him up. And several thousand years later, he still speaks. You don't get rid of him like that. What Jesus is doing, though, in all of that, in all of that resistance to the pressure of the world and the flesh and the devil, in all of that, Jesus' business is opening heaven and not closing people off. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's not come to condemn the world, so that through him the world might have life. And he looks for those he can encourage on the basis that they are not far from the kingdom of God. He's looking for the person of peace who may be coming at him with the hostile question to begin with, but whose heart is open to the kingdom of God. Now religion won't do that. Religion is going to insist on winning the argument. But the life of repentance that Jesus is calling for puts God first and seeks to serve his image in the shape that it takes now of fallen humanity. And repentance and faith in us on an ongoing basis take us and keep us going there. It's the great commandment then the Great Commission, embodied and lived at the core of our missional community. And that's what the Church of God is to be. Mm. At the core of our missional community and its, our, responses to increasing hostility. Because restoring people like the man in this account is the business that we're being called to engage in.